Before we begin, I just wanted to personally thank all the incredibly supportive listeners who have donated or signed up to be patrons of this show. I felt uncomfortable about launching a subscription package. I'm not particularly comfortable asking for help, but after three years of work, I had to be realistic and either take the jobs I was being offered to say what other people wanted me to say or get over being uncomfortable and ask for help in order to continue doing this independent work. So if you enjoy our content and think we're offering something worthwhile, please consider joining all the amazing people who have become Politics Girl Premium subscribers and sign up for a subscription package. You'll get access to ad-free episodes of the podcast, direct emails of the rants, discounted merch, a monthly AMA, and the opportunity for in-person meet and greets. I've said it before and I'll say it again, not selling out is expensive, but with your support, we'll be able to continue. To subscribe, just click the link in the show notes or go to politicsgirl.com slash premium to check out the various plans. Thank you for caring enough about democracy to be here. We literally couldn't do this without you. Now, on to the show. Hello, and welcome to the Politics Girl podcast. I'm your host, Lee McGowan. Let's get into it. In a time of alternative facts, fake news, conspiracy theories, and what feels like endless lies from one political party hoping to retain power, how do we come together? How do we fight back against two completely separate realities? To talk about this, our guest today is Lee McIntyre, the best-selling author of multiple books, Post-Truth, How to Talk to a Science Denier, and On Disinformation, whose work has appeared everywhere, from the New York Times to the Washington Post to Newsweek and Scientific American. Lee has appeared on CNN, PBS, NPR, BBC, and has spoken at the United Nations, the Aspen Institute, and the Vatican. He has been called the foremost scholar of science denial and an intellectual activist combating the attempted assassination of truth. I'm having him on today to discuss his idea that in a post-truth America, reality isn't dying by accident. It's being poisoned on purpose. And to get his thoughts on what we can do to stop it from happening. So without further ado, please welcome my guest, author, scholar, and expert on disinformation, Lee McIntyre. Welcome, Lee. Thank you for having me on. Thank you for joining me. I mean, this is quite a time in American history, and I think for those of us who are paying attention, it's quite an alarming time. But I'm not sure if enough people really realize how close we are to losing everything we take for granted, namely our democracy and all the freedoms that come with it. So I'm really pleased to be talking to you today and to give people a bit more insight on how to deal with the misinformation and disinformation that's kind of corrupting the very fabric of our lives right now. I agree. (laughs) (laughs) Well, to start off, okay, I think that you believe there needs to be a distinction made between misinformation and disinformation. So you want to talk us through that? Yeah, I think that's the threshold to really, you know, making any progress on this problem. Because uh, misinformation is an accident. It's when you, you know, believe something that's not true, but uh, it, you know, it's accidental. And so you might even be convinced by evidence. Disinformation is a lie. And so disinformation is created by someone for, you know, nef- with nefarious intent who wants you to believe a falsehood, usually because it serves their interest and not yours. So somebody might, you know, in good faith, believe that disinformation the same way they would believe the misinformation. But there's a little bit of a catch here, which is that disinformation is not just a falsehood that's created by a disinformer, it's usually got more emotional content and it's geared toward making you polarized, you know, around a factual issue so that you distrust or even hate people who are on the other side of it. So that really forestalls the chance to be convinced by evidence because when you're disinformed, usually it's a hot enough message that you're thinking, well, my goodness, if this is true, I can't trust other people. So misinformation is a mistake where you unknowingly spread incorrect news, but disinformation is a lie. It's uh, when you do it on purpose to intentionally create and you mean to deceive. So let's focus then on disinformation because you've been quoted saying there are two purposes behind disinformation. One is to get your audience to believe the lie, but the other, which might be worse, is to get the believer to distrust the people who don't believe the lie and to that's demonize right. and hate those who see things differently. That That's right. And I mean, if you think about it, 
the insidious part of that is it doesn't just give you one falsehood. It might give you several because right. it doesn't just undermine the truth of one the particular thing you're talking about. It undermines the process by which maybe you learn about other truths. And so it means that, you know, you you believe this one falsehood, but you're also maybe distrusting the other people who could provide you with correcting evidence. And so you're led down the path. And, you know, as we're here talking, I just thought of there's another purpose behind this information, which is that even if they can't convince you that the falsehood is, in fact, truth, sometimes what they can do is use the, you know, the mere assertion of the falsehood to make you cynical, to just, you know, bury you with so much, you know, disinformation, propaganda, whatever you want to call it, that you just, you become cynical and think there's, there is no truth. There's no way to know truth. You often see this used by authoritarians who maybe know that they're spreading their propaganda and the citizens are not necessarily going to believe it. But the thing is, they can't, they have to pretend that they believe it because, you know, there's no use fighting back. The, the authoritarian has asserted his will and we'd better succumb. That's what they want. They want us to be cynical and pliant and unquestioning so that they can rule us. You write that the post truth playbook goes like this attack the truth tellers, lie about anything and everything, manufacture disinformation, encourage distrust and polarization, create confusion and cynicism, and then claim that the truth is only available from the leader themselves. So the goal is not just to get people to believe any particular lie, but to demoralize them with kind of like a tsunami of lies so that they give up on the very idea of truth. So this concept, like if we look at if you don't believe the election was stolen, then you must be a bad person who doesn't care about America and is out here to ruin the country. Maybe you even deserve to be punished. So that's how we get to a point where someone feels perfectly within their right to say, lock her up or to break into your place of work while you're doing your job and try and hang you. Or the young guy at Turning Point USA who said, when do we start using the guns? How many elections do these people have to steal before we can shoot them, right? So disinformation is created to provide an action, but also to be polarizing, right? Because you've said that the thought being, if you can get a community divided over factual issues, you use the example, the COVID vaccine, is it safe or is it not mm -hmm. safe? It is safe. But if you can get the community divided over that, that factual issue, then it makes the disinformation giver's job that much easier because- they don't want you just to believe the lie. They want to divide us into us and them based right. on that lie. That, that's exactly, I love the way you put that. That is exactly right because it's about team building. It's about building a team around a lie. And so, you know, how it ends up is that, um, I mean, beliefs lead to actions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, whether or not you actually believe the particular thing is maybe not as important to the disinformer as that you act on that belief. And I mean, that sounds like a subtle, maybe a philosopher's distinction. But the important point is, if you can get him to believe this thing, then you can get him to act in a certain way. If you can get him to believe that the 2020 election was stolen, maybe you can get him to go to the January 6th uh, insurrection, right? So that's the, that's the goal behind it. And it's uh, it, it's a it's a very dangerous one because you you end up where the people who believe the falsehood are really victims, and they don't self-identify. They don't realize that they're victims. But according to the disinformer, it doesn't matter because through disinformation they've created what I call strategic denial. They're they're not just getting people to doubt; they're getting them to actually deny and to join a community of other people who also deny. And the community part's probably essential there. I mean, because you've said that there are three things that are necessary for that kind of strategic denial or strategic disinformation to be successful. It has to be created, obviously, then it has to be amplified, and then it has to be believed. But I feel like the amplification part is the key there because you can create a lie, but no one will believe it without repetition and amplification. And I feel like one of the primary tactics of disinformation has always been repetition. You know, we think about Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's minister of propaganda, saying if you tell a lie 
big enough. You just keep repeating it and people will come to believe it. So we have disinformation creators, then we have disinformation amplifiers, and then we have the believers. And in many ways, those are three completely separate groups. They are. And there are three separate chapters in my book. One I mean, yeah. unimaginatively called the creators, the amplifiers, and the believers. And I see <laughs> this as a pipeline because the thing is, once you realize that you're actually in a disinformation war, that this isn't about misinformation, this is about disinformation, it's intentional, then you could ask yourself, okay, how do we fight it? Could you get the disinformers to stop? Well, that's hard to do because it's maybe in their interest not to stop. In some cases, they're Vladimir Putin. I mean, they're in a foreign country. How are you going to pass an American law to get, you know, a foreign leader to stop. So that, you know, that's a difficult thing to do. How are you going to get the believers to admit that they've been victimized, to, you know, to admit that they were wrong? That's a very hard thing to do. Now, I wrote a whole book on this called How to Talk to a Science Denier, where, you know, I think this is important work to do. But the point is, it's not sufficient. You know, it's, it's not a scalable solution to fight the enormity of the disinformation problem. So I think you're precisely right that the way to fight this is take that pipe and squeeze it right in the middle, the amplification of disinformation. That's where we're going to make the most progress. Right, because it's the amplification um, and the complete repetition of these lies that we keep hearing is how we end up with people believing something when all evidence points to the opposite, right? Your opinion on that is because by the time someone truly believes disinformation, it's no longer necessarily even based in fact, but it ends up being rooted in their identity. Yes. And you use this great example of a social psychology experiment in the mid fifties that showed that 33% of people tested would claim a line, which was clearly shorter than another line was longer if other people in their group had already done so. So they would rather be wrong, but in the group that felt right, than stand alone and say the truth. In fact, people end up uh, doubting their own perspective when it goes against what the group has said, right? And this, of course, falls into the lane of conformity and tribalism and how people are more willing to forgive or believe people that they deem to be on their side rather than the opposite. And respectively, how people are more likely to disbelieve someone despite overwhelming evidence, if that person isn't perceived to be on their side. So we're clearly heavily influenced by our communities and how we see ourselves in relation to the people around us. Yes, tribal belief is reinforced by our community. I mean, we believe in some cases what we want to believe because it suits our ego. Right. But part of that is wanting to fit in with the people that we identify with. And the really yeah. scary thing about that experiment is that you just described by Solomon Ash in the 1950s at Swarthmore College. Do the people say yes, that the, the, the shorter line is longer, knowing that it's not, but they just want to fit in? Or do they say it because after a few iterations, they start to actually believe it? Yeah. That's the really scary part, right? Um, I don't know if you remember the scene at the end of the novel, 1984. I mean, I'm not ruining it for anybody. Everybody's read 1984. But just, you know, reminding you of the scene where, you know, the, the Winston Smith is being tortured and they're trying to convince, they're trying to get him to answer the question, you know, what does two plus two equal? And, you know, he won't say two plus two equals five. That's what they want him to say. He'll keep saying two plus two equals four and he keeps getting shocked. And then he finally says four, five, I don't care. I don't know. And that's the right answer. That's the anything you want it to be, sir. That's the right answer, right? Yeah. And so, you know, does the person at a certain point even care that the shorter line is longer? Why would they? Do they care that the 2020 election was stolen as long as everybody around them believes it and they get to vote for the person they want? So, you know, I'm not a psychologist, but it uh, there, I read a really terrific book one time called The Folly of Fools by a, an evolutionary biologist named Ro Robert Trivers, in which he argues that self-delusion is a very powerful force in human reasoning. And that, you know, there's a case to be made that sometimes people are saying a falsehood knowing that it's false, but sometimes 
they believe that it's false. Uh, I think uh, it was Larry Speaks, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan's, uh, uh, one of his uh, uh, spokespeople, who said, if you tell the same story three times, it's true. I mean, how many times do you have to repeat a lie before you start to think it's true? That's the scary part to me. There's an old Seinfeld thing where George Costanza says, it's not a lie if you believe it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I remember. Oh, I love Seinfeld. I remember that. Yeah. yeah very I good. mean, I think that what you're talking about, though, is so fascinating because disinformation then pertains so clearly to the Trump years because obviously Trump used this kind of disinformation before he was president, right? He was a successful yes. businessman. He was a billionaire. He was the leader of the Obama is not an American disinformation birtherism, right? And then he started his disinformation campaign from the very beginning of his presidency. If I don't win, it was rigged. My inauguration crowd was bigger, you know, the biggest one of all time. All these things that are easily provable lies, he would continue to double down on them. But more importantly, he had his staff double down on them, right? Sean Spicer lost credibility for the rest of his life by continuing to insist that the crowd size was bigger, right? And if you use that crowd size lie, you are under the impression that Trump wasn't really trying to convince anyone his crowd size was bigger. It was his way of saying, if you want to be on my side, right. you have to say it was bigger. He's grooming them for conformity. And he got right. his staff to do it, which was representing to his followers, oh, that's what we should do. I see. We don't actually have to believe it. We just have to be willing to say that we believe it and, and act on it. But, you know, some of these other great experiments from the 1950s in social psychology, the kind of the, the golden age of social, social psychology showed that if you can get people to act on a false belief, they're more likely to actually believe it. You know, there, there was another experiment. I don't remember who, I don't remember the, the year. I mean, I'm going back years here where they would take people and get them to write out political signs that they didn't agree with. You know, so say you were pro-choice and they had you write a sign that was, you know, pro-life. And then you would have to go out and hold this sign. And Ooh, in some cases, hard. in some cases, they paid you a lot of money. And in other cases, I think they paid very little, and in some cases, they didn't pay anything at all. And this tested something uh, that I'm sure you know the term cognitive dissonance, right? Because the people, and then they would ask people later how much they, you know, did they actually believe what was on the sign that previously they hadn't believed? And what they found is that the people who were paid a lot of money said, no, not, not really. But the people who weren't paid that much money or who weren't paid at all, said, yeah, you know, maybe they kind of got a point because they were squaring in their mind the idea that how could I actually be a thoughtful person and be out there holding up a sign for something I don't believe? I must actually kind of believe it. Maybe they've yeah. got a good point, you know? So it was a, it was a means of manipulating, pe manipulating belief and manipulating behavior, right? If you just paid the Trump supporters you know, to say that they, you know, believe the 2020 election was stolen wouldn't be nearly as powerful as getting them to actually believe it. But, you know, Trump, for all his buffoonery and idiocy, is a master propagandist. He understands the Russian disinformation tactics and uses them very uh, effectively. And, uh, you know, that's one of them. Yeah. I mean, look at uh, how he's attempting to control the narrative around his indictments, right? That's for right. him, it's not about facts and evidence. And now for his people, it's not about facts and evidence. It's about disinformation. It's about spin. It's about the story they want to believe, that it's a witch hunt, that it's not fair, that it's, a That's you right. know, the Biden Justice Department coming after him. And it seems like he thinks he can keep this up all the way through his trials and again through the election. And honestly, he might be right. I mean, right. if we consider the people at the Trump rallies and the behavior of the Republican members of the House right now, they kind of seem all in for this identity created around this disinformation. This really worries me. I mean, this is why I wrote the book, because I saw the 2024, I mean, I started thinking about the book before the 2022 midterms. And then I thought, but this is not going to be over by then. I mean, this is really a, a 2024 matter because that's when the, you know, the, the watershed moment is going to come. Yeah. And you know what? He just might make it because all he needs, you know, so he's going to say that he won the election no matter what. 
If he actually wins, then he's going to say that. If he doesn't, he's going to double down on the idea that, well, they stole another one. And maybe it'll maybe even lead to violence. I mean, I, I don't think that he's beyond encouraging you know, mass violence. Um, I think he'd kind of like mass violence. May, and so would Steve Bannon would. and so would, uh, you know, Michael Flynn, all these people behind him. Violence serves their kind of burn yes. it all down. Yeah. The, yeah. Emotion. I mean, there was, I don't know whether it, well, I, I probably shouldn't share some that I don't know whether it's, uh, whether it's true, but let me preface it by saying, I don't know whether this was true, that there was a report that when Trump was in his dining room watching the uh, January 6th rally, you know, they're saying, hang Mike Pence. He was saying, hang, hang, hang. I mean, he's not necessarily, if that's true, I mean, it shows he's not necessarily averse to violence. And I mean, he said in his rallies, you know, go punch this person in the face, et cetera. So, he asked I mean, the military if they could shoot the protesters when yes. he walked out to, you know, and they were like, no, we can't shoot the protesters. Or, he was like, in the knees. The and border. they were like, no. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's very upsetting. So it, it is upsetting because I think that he's trying to get the pieces in place, which includes the speaker's race, for somebody to be in place that even if he loses, there is a fig leaf. There's some sort of a mechanism by which um, he could be declared the winner. And you know what? It's right there in the American Constitution that if there is a, a dispute over the electoral count, it gets thrown into the House of Representatives where each state gets one vote. And there are no rules for how the House handles this, how they choose. So the point is, if there are enough Republican elected representatives and they were willing to ignore what the actual vote was, they could just go ahead and appoint him. And I think he would be fine with that. And yeah. so the way you stop something like this is to fight back. And the primary way to fight back is to admit that you're in a disinformation war. This is not a hurricane. You don't just put your head down and wait it out. You've got to fight. And I saw this. I saw people fight in 2016 once Trump was elected. You know, I went to the Women's March. I went to the March for Science. I went to a lot of marches and saw people out there protesting. I think we need to get our hands dirty and do that now, not wait until the bad result, but anticipate the bad result. And so in, in the book, I at the end of the book, after these you know chapters on the creators, the amplifiers, the believers. I have a whole chapter on, you know, 10 things that the ordinary citizen can do to fight back. And that's because, you know, an ancillary goal of disinformation, or maybe actually the point, is to get you to feel helpless, to get you to feel like there's nothing you can do. But you're not helpless. There are actually things you can do, and we've got barely enough time to do it. And the government and social media and journalists are not coming to save us. So we've all got to grab an oar and uh, get started on this. And as you say, the very first way we fight back against this real deliberate attack on truth and this terrible behavior is that we admit we're already in an information war. Yes. And that is the first key step. Um, it makes me think of that old Mark Twain quote, it's easier to fool someone than to convince them they've been fooled. Right. So we can't necessarily just turn people overnight and say, here's the evidence and believe me, first of all, they're not going to believe us because we've already been set up to be their enemy and they aren't going to believe us because we're their enemy. And I think that's one of the reasons that we do this in the, you know, in the first place, people have said to me from the beginning, they're like, all right, yeah, so Trump's a liar, but like all politicians are liars, right? We've known politicians have been liars for years. Like, how is this different? And it's different because You've said, even though disinformation is a lie, it doesn't mean all lies are disinformation. So like an old politician that lied, for example, about having an affair with someone, and then we find out the truth. Now that lie may or may not result in accountability, but until very recently, the politician caught in that lie wouldn't try to gaslight the rest of us into pretending that story was deep faked by his political enemies or the video had been altered or the person caught on camera was really a body double. Like this is a completely different world that we're living in now. And you're of the opinion that Trump is the first person in American history to really run a very successful domestic disinformation campaign yeah. where he doesn't just lie, he seeks to control reality. So that level of disinformation is at a completely different level now where people have to look at him and it's like, if I say it, it's true. And if you don't agree with me, then you are the enemy. And the people who believe him look at the rest of us like the enemy. So it really doesn't matter what information we're giving them, what evidence we're showing them. Um, 
they're going to have trouble believing it because we have already been set up to be evil. And so you're talking about steps that we could potentially take to counter that. I'm so pleased that Thrive Cosmetics is a sponsor of the show. Whether you like to be fresh-faced, full glam, or somewhere in between, you've probably seen Thrive Cosmetics Viral Tubing Mascara. It's the one in the turquoise tube that's all over your socials. And it's the one, if you listen to this show, that I talk about all the time because it's my personal go-to. Thrive Cosmetics is a beauty line made with clean, skin-loving ingredients. No parabens, sulfates, or phthalates. It's 100% vegan and cruelty-free, so you know no animals were harmed when they made it. But they also put the word cause in their name for a reason, because every purchase you make supports organizations and communities that you care about. Like I said, I talk about their Liquid Lash Extension Mascara all the time because it's that good. I'm a blonde eyelash gal who requires mascara to not appear eyeless, but I also shed mascara like crazy. So it's hard for me to get through the day without looking like a raccoon. But the Liquid Lash Extension Mascara is a tubing formula that mimics the look of lash extensions without damaging your lashes. It doesn't clump or smudge or flake. All you need is a little warm water to get it off. It's that easy. But don't take my word for it. Try it out for yourself. Right now, you can get an exclusive 20% off your first order at thrivecosmetics.com slash politicsgirl. That's Thrive Cosmetics, spelled C-A-U-S-E-M-E-T-I-C-S, dot com slash politicsgirl for 20% off your first order. Thrive Cosmetics. It's luxury beauty that gives back. I think we can all agree that no one likes smelly garbage that attracts fruit flies and ants to our kitchens, but most of us are still doing our trash like it's 100 years ago. Well, not anymore. Welcome to the future with Lomi, the biggest innovation in the modern kitchen since the dishwasher. Lomi is a countertop electric composter that turns food scraps into plant food in under four hours. I know the planet is facing a major crisis, so any step I can take to limit my family's personal carbon footprint, I'm going to do it. So instead of sending our kitchen waste to a landfill, I can help the environment and turn it into an all-natural fertilizer. Plus, Lomi promises to bring you the best possible experience every time you run a cycle, which is why they're one of the only kitchen appliances that has a full, no questions asked, lifetime warranty on all devices. And it doesn't stop there. Lomi looks after you from day one and beyond. You'll automatically get upgraded to a new Lomi device every three years. Honestly, it's just one more reason to love my Lomi. No more stinky trash bins or leaky bags making a mess when we try and empty it. Whether you want to start making a positive environmental impact, having a cleaner kitchen, or just growing a beautiful garden, Lomi is perfect for you. Head to Lomi.com slash politicsgirl and use the promo code politicsgirl to get $50 off your Lomi. That's $50 off when you head to Lomi.com slash politicsgirl and use the promo code politicsgirl at checkout. As always, thank you, Lomi, for sponsoring this episode. Did you know poor sleep can cause weight gain, mood issues, poor mental health, and lower productivity? Did you know that sleeping less than six to seven hours a night is linked to a reduced white blood cell count? Do you know that white blood cells protect our body against illness and diseases and fight viruses and bacteria? So sleep really is the foundation of our mental and physical health, which is why having a consistent nighttime routine is non-negotiable. Now, we used to make jokes that my husband could sleep standing up, but lately his schedule has been so off that sleeping was becoming a problem, which is why we can sincerely rave about Beam Dream Powder. Dream Powder is Beam's best-selling hot cocoa for sleep. It contains an all-natural blend of reishi, magnesium, L-theanine, melatonin, and nano-CBD to help you fall asleep, stay asleep, and wake up refreshed. In fact, a recent clinical study showed that Dream helped 93% of users wake up feeling more refreshed. And 93% reported that Dream helped them get a more restful night's sleep. You just mix Beam Dream into hot water or milk, stir or froth, and drink it at bedtime. Today, my listeners get a special discount on Beam Dream Powder, their best-selling hot cocoa for sleep with no added sugar. Now available in delicious flavors like sea salt caramel, cinnamon cocoa, and chocolate peanut butter. Find out why Forbes and the New York Times are talking about Beam and why it's trusted by the world's top athletes and business professionals. If you want to try Beam's best-selling dream powder, take advantage of their biggest sale of the year and get up to 50% off for a limited time when you go to shopbeam.com slash politicsgirl and use the code cyber at checkout. That's shopbeam.com slash politicsgirl and use the code cyber for up to 50% off. Beam Dream. Better sleep has never tasted better. 
And speaking of sleep, I can't believe I'm saying this, but winter is here, which means struggling to find the right temperature while you sleep. Did you know that it's your temperature at night that has one of the greatest impacts on your sleep quality? If you're one of those people who finds themselves waking up too hot or too cold, then you might wanna check out Miracle Made bed sheets. Inspired by NASA, Miracle Made uses silver infused fabrics to make temperature regulating bedding so you can sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. The silver infused sheets also prevent up to 99.7% of bacterial growth, leaving them to stay cleaner and fresher three times longer than other sheets. Plus, Miracle Sheets are also just really nice without the high price tag of other luxury brands. To see for yourself, go to trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl to try it today or gift it to someone this holiday season. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Save over 40% by using our promo code politicsgirl at checkout, and you'll also get three free towels and save an extra 20%. That's a great deal. And Miracle is so confident in their product that they've backed it with a 30-day money-back guarantee. So if you aren't 100% satisfied, you'll get a full refund. Upgrade your sleep today with Miracle Made. Go to trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl and use the code politicsgirl to claim your three free towels and save over 40%. Again, that's trymiracle.com slash politicsgirl to treat yourself, a friend, or a loved one this holiday season. Thank you, Miracle Made, for continuing to sponsor the Politics Girl podcast. We have already been set up to be evil. And so you're talking about steps that we could potentially take to counter that. It's funny, the way you describe it, hearing you describe it, just from the remove of just hearing somebody else say the words, it sounds like psychosis, doesn't it? It sounds like, you know, this person is untethered from reality. And I think that's doing... why people keep using the word cult, right? Because it yeah. feels like you've sort of, yeah. you've, you've left your uh, conscious thinking, uh, critical mind over on the side, and you've mm-hmm. taken a full dip into whatever I'm told to do, I will do whatever I'm yes. told to think, I will think. And so it does end up feeling a bit like psychosis. And so what and, do you do? He's, he's giving, because he's giving permission to people that they can do this. He can do it so they can do it too. They can double down on the lie. They don't have to feel accountability or blame. Think of John Edwards when he was caught. Well, you know, he admitted it and he left the scene. But what if what if he doubled down? You know, what if he didn't have to do that? Trump is saying, you don't have to give an inch. You don't ever have to admit you're wrong. Look what I do. And that feels sort of freeing, I think, for people. And I don't think it's far-fetched to think of it as a cult. Um, Steve Hassan wrote a whole book called The Cult of Trump, where you know yeah. he argues that, that that's what's going on here. Now, look, how do you get someone out of a cult? You know, how how what do you, what do you do? I think Steve Hassan would say, but based on what I, I read in his book. You don't tell them that they're insane. You have to show them love and respect. You have to be calm. You have to show them there's something to come back to because it's really about identity. It's not just about belief. It's about identity. Now, that's a very, very hard thing to do. I mean, even if it's it's a family member or friends. And again, my earlier book, How to Talk to a Science Denier, recommended face-to-face, calm, patient, respectful conversation. But But I've got to tell you, that doesn't always work. (laughs) <laughs> and it's also, again, not up to the scale of the problem. We can't debunk our way out of this infodemic, right? We've got to figure out what to do. And so I think, you know, think about another thing that happens in a cult. One of their rules is you've got to cut off all ties with anybody outside the cult. And why do they do that? It's because they're afraid that you might be listening to other people. And so don't cut off your friends who are MAGA. Uh, keep the lines of communication open. And by the way, keep them from, if you can, keep them from hearing more disinformation. I mean, I heard a case the other day, this was, um, <laughs> this was, I, I thought this was, this was funny. Other people may may not think that it was funny. It was about this woman who went to her parents' home and they were, you know, hardcore MAGA supporters watching Fox News every night. And while she was there, she changed the parental controls on their TV so that they couldn't get Fox anymore. And they didn't know what was going on. They complained. They, they just said later, you know, for some reason, we can't get, get Fox on TV anymore. And she said, well, you'll find something to watch. And they sort of kind of came back to her. And there's a whole book on this, uh, Jen uh, Senko's book, The Brainwashing of My Dad. So yeah. disinformation 
has to be amplified and it has to be constant, which is why they repeat it. Because if you can actually manage to cut somebody off from the disinformation source, they might come back to you and it might keep other people from getting infected. And then you've also got the gutless people in Congress who understand yeah. that it's a cult, who understand that it's disinformation, but you know are, are too cowardly and too worried about their own election. Um, but you know, if, if you could do something to disrupt the flow of disinformation is my point. Uh, yeah. People may not want to change somebody else's parental controls. I, you know, I don't think that's what they mean by parental controls on the TV. You don't do it for your parents. You do it for your kids. But, um, you know, there, you might think of ways that might be better than that to work. Well, listen, I mean, you give a lot of good examples in the book, and I would highly recommend people go and pick up this book. It's not a long read, but it does give you a lot of tangible steps in which to take and refer back to. One of the things you're talking about, if we're going to talk about TV, is confronting the liars. Like, we cannot just keep allowing liars to have microphones without pushing back, which is why the media has been such a problem with this both sidesing of everything. And as you said, confusing misinformation where people rightfully believe something and they're just wrong about it and disinformation where people are deliberately lying and no one is pushing back. So we need to accept that there is a difference between truth and a lie. And that goes beyond opinion. And if we accept that there are lies out there, then we have to acknowledge that there are liars. And if we know who the liars are, then we have to call them out. Or at the very least, we can't keep giving them microphones and booking them on TV shows. Like no election denier should be platformed anymore, right? At the end of the day, the truth is the truth. The election was not stolen and we don't need to continue to hear from people who continue to say it was with all evidence to the contrary. One of the other things you say is that truth itself is actually a very effective weapon against disinformation, but it has to be told loudly and repeatedly. Like the truth also needs amplification, yeah. right? We can't worry that we're going to hurt someone's feelings by challenging their beliefs or telling them the truth because at the end of the day, we're actually doing them a favor and autocrats understand you know, people that are pushing authoritarianism, which is what we're actually quite in danger of here, they understand the danger of the truth. That's why autocrats go in immediately and shut down the free press. That's why they jail dissenters. That's why they shut down public displays of protest and throw people in jail. They recognize that people amplifying the truth is a threat to their power. And if citizens have other things to consider, they might not believe them anymore. Truth is a power that everyone can wield. And I think your point is so well taken about this kind of concept that of resisting polarization because it's that's such an interesting one because i feel like you're saying even if you know you're on the side of truth and facts right even if you know you're telling the truth just allowing our society to continue to become even more fragmented in that us and them mentality is dangerous because if we stop talking to everyone who we disagree with or everyone that we know is wrong then it becomes easier for those people who are spreading disinformation to divide us because we are helping with that, right? Yeah. That we need to remember that this goal of disinformation is not just to get us to doubt things, but to get us to distrust people who are on the other side. So you get to the point where you think of people who disagree with you as your enemy, and we can't play into that. We can't That's actually right. be their enemy, right? As hard as it is to do, we have to try to not just retreat to our silos where we know we're right. We have to continue to kind of reach out to those who disagree with us and the people who have been, like you said, unfortunately, victims of disinformation. Yes. And it is best if we do it with kindness. It, it, it is. And it, it's important. I and mean, that's it, hard. We, it, we acknowledge that it, that's it hard. It is hard. <laughs> if you remember that they're victims, it can help you to have some empathy. And, yeah. you know, to understand the kind of fix that they're in. Yeah, they've been duped, right? I mean, they've, they've been, been duped. They've been duped, yes. Yeah. And like you said, nobody wants to admit that they've been duped. I mean, yeah. Soledad O'Brien uh, was really, you know, taking the lead on this, saying that CNN and other networks should not be booking liars on their program. You know, yeah. why, why do they do this? Why do they give them a platform? And then some journalists, you know, will probably push back and say, but, they're newsmakers, you know, they're, they're, we're not, and we're not interviewing them about the election. We're interviewing them about other things, but, you know, there are enough journalists out there who, you know, understand how do you interview a dictator? How do you interview a, a liar? How do you interview, you know, think of all these autocratic leaders, you know, when they, when 
Christian Amanpour gets a, you know a chance to you know to interview some uh, some you know brutal dictator. She does a an enormously good job because she knows what she's going into and she knows how to ask tough questions. You don't just mm -hmm. go and put a microphone in front of their face. And no. that's too often what we see. Uh, so I love Jonathan Swan's interview of Trump where he didn't let him get away with it. I mean, you might say, okay, so don't platform him. Don't you know let him have the microphone. Well, what he did was he realized, okay, I'm gonna give him a microphone, but it's not gonna be live. So I'm, I'm gonna be able to edit and you know fact check and I'm also, there's not going to be any audience there to back him up. And so I'm going to be able to say, you know, when he shows me some statistic that's bogus, I'm going to be able to hand him something back. That's very different from what happened with Caitlin Collins, who was sort of set up. I don't think it was her fault with that, you know, enormously MAGA crowd. And just, you know, Trump was allowed to just lie as long as he wanted uh, for, you know, the whole hour on CNN. That was a televised rally with a host. That's right. Televised rally with with her as the as the victim. It's yeah. that's not that's a textbook example of how not to fight back against disinformation. So the one on one level, don't don't let yourself be polarized to the point where you're cutting yourself off from people just because you think they're wrong. Be that person in their life that they still like and maybe will go to when they've got a question about the vaccine or about the election. But on the macro level, there are other things that you can do uh, about amp the amplification of disinformation. And again, people may feel helpless. But one thing that I advocate in my book is you've actually got a lot more power than you think. How many people have actually ever written to a member of Congress? How many people have ever written to you know, a, a TV or a radio station where they you know, didn't like the message and said, you know, you're spreading disinformation, et cetera, et cetera. And here's a next level thing. I learned this one from, uh, from Joan Donovan, my new colleague at BU. She said, you know, don't just write to Twitter and Facebook, write to Akamai and PayPal, write to all of these companies that those, uh, without which Twitter and Facebook would be out of business and say, you know, I don't like what's happening at Twitter and Facebook because of the way they're handling this information. You know, it's probably pretty, pretty rare for, you know, um, for PayPal to get a letter about something like that. But they they might take it seriously if they got more than one. Elon Musk was under some scrutiny there for a while when he was losing advertisers because all of a sudden, well, you know, you can't, I don't care if you're a billionaire, you can't just go on Twitter and say anything you want and you know make any changes you want because you've got to worry about ad revenue. And so he started to worry about that. So there are ways to put pressure on liars and their amplifiers if we can just find the right leverage. We don't have to just give in. No, we have to insist that our media outlets stop normalizing this, stop That's normalizing right. the lies and the liars. We have to stop taking it and we have to ask for better. I mean, young people are getting a lot of their uh, information from social media. That's another place that we could ask to be countering the lies. That's we right. could have our politicians be writing legislation for what can be said and not said and what the uh, ramifications are for spreading lies on social media. And then, of course, we need to counter lies with the truth. Like I said, we have to amplify the truth more often. We have to marginalize the liars and the people who are profiting from the lies. And I do think we need to ask the government and big tech to help us out in that. And that's where political activism comes in and getting yes. Congress to regulate social media. Because clearly, the algorithms and the pay structure of advertising on network television sure. is geared towards engagement, but not truth, because that's where the money comes from, right? Big tech could do way more, but it would hurt their bottom line, so they don't. So they're going to have to be forced to by government. And network television could do a lot more, but only if we say we're not watching this, if you're going to continue to put these liars on TV. And that is kind of what we have to do. We have to insist that they stop normalizing this because it's chaos right now and it does make us all sort of shut down and feel terrible. You know, I think we need to remember that there's more of us out here who believe in truth and facts and democracy than the alternative. It's just that the alternative is very loud and has gotten a lot of attention and we need to be working together to hold these priorities up. And, and the first step in working together is to realize that we're all in this common conflict, which is a disinformation war. Not, not, it's not a misinformation crisis, it's disinformation. I'm not sure, the one piece of what you said that I'm, that I'm not sure about is uh, government. 
because I'm not sure they're going to, in time, be able to rescue us. In Congress, time, yeah. Congress has had a lot of bites at the apple to try to, to do something with social media, and they have always declined, even when there were hair-on-fire warnings. I mean, the, I mentioned Joan Donovan uh, uh, before. She testified before Congress on the, the amplification of algorithmic disinformation. And Democrats and Republicans afterward really refused to do anything. I mean, Chris Coons, who's a Democrat, said at the time, well, you know, we're not looking to regulate anybody right now. The closing of her testimony, she said, the biggest problem facing our nation is misinformation at scale. The cost of doing nothing is democracy's end. I mean, that'd light my hair on fire. I mean, what kind of a warning is that from, you know, maybe the leading disinformation expert in the world? Just today, I read in the newspaper that the Supreme Court had uh, stayed the lower judge's ruling that the Biden administration could not contact social media. So you remember there was that lower court ruling upheld by the Fifth Circuit to say, partially upheld, to say Biden or his uh, spokespeople couldn't speak to Twitter or Facebook or any of the rest of them about COVID disinformation, about election disinformation, which really, you know, I mean, they, really, they they can't take the, the public interest. It really in ties mind. their hands. Yeah. So, I mean, people, people like Elon Musk and many other people say, well, but that's censorship. The First Amendment is supposed to protect us from government, you know, uh, censorship. And they're right. So, I mean, the government, th this is why when the government gets involved with it, pe people get nervous. But social media companies, they're free to do what they want. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act allows them to do what they want and not get sued. They can put up or take down what you know whatever they fancy. Now, if the government is saying, "Look, you know, if you put up this disinformation, you know, there will be you know killing in you know this particular country, or this many people will die because of vaccine misinformation." I think they need to know that. That's yeah. a separate European question. European nations do it all the time. European nations yes, they do. do it all the time. They regulate social media. They regulate yeah. media to make sure that their people aren't being fed constant lies. If we run our society based on profit alone, then it will never, we'll never do anything. And I think that's what you're saying yeah. about government. You're like, I don't know if it'll happen in time. Like perhaps it can't happen right now, but it doesn't mean that our legislators that we yeah. elect in the future shouldn't be people that want to make a difference and not allow us to be fed a constant stream of lies uh, without ramification. Yeah. Because I think, as you say, the truth doesn't die when liars take power. It dies when truth tellers stop defending it. Exactly. And we and and we should expect our members of Congress to defend it on our behalf. Um, right. The one th thing immediately that I would like to see them do is to pass the first regulation that they could pass is one not of um, regulation per se, right? Like they're the fact checker in chief, but transparency. Um, this was an idea that came from Stephen Lewandowski, a cognitive scientist at University of Bristol. Um, who makes the argument that what we need is a sort of a radical transparency over the algorithms mm -hmm. that the social media companies are using, because that's where the trouble is coming from. As you said, they're geared toward engagement and they're amplifying lies. So why not figure that out in advance of the harm, right? Before the genocide, before, you know, before the people die, uh, you know, because they've taken it, you know, a phony cure for, for the disease or something. So what, right. what Lewandowski recommends is a panel of experts, you know, academic and other sorts of experts who have access to the algorithms um, and can make recommendations. You know, why do we always have to wait for a whistleblower? Can't, you know, can't yeah. we ever head off some of this harm? You'd have to shield user data. You know, you'd have to make it so that, you know, it, it wasn't something where people's privacy was, uh, something that you worried about. But could you have academic experts looking at these algorithms? You could. And I think that would be a gigantic step in the right direction. We also know social media companies absolutely have the tech in order to stop disinformation. They did it for a while on Facebook and then found they weren't making as much money, so That's they right. pulled it back. So it is absolutely possible. We just have to insist on it as a people. We have to keep telling the truth. We have to keep exposing the lies and the liars, right? We need to name these liars. Yes. And we need to you know, connect their financial ties and point out their tactics because – if we can, we can wake up as many people as we can. Uh, and it's obviously, it's a lot of work to do, but the alternative is hideous. 
So we just have to believe it's not a lost cause and we have to keep That's plugging right. away and amplifying the truth and asking uh, to punish the, the liars. I, I, I agree. I, I don't want to be on the right side, you know, on the correct side, but we lose our democracy. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to be the person who says, oh, well, yeah, we lost our democracy, but at least I was standing up for the right thing. I don't want to see us lose our democracy. I mean, I want to try to tell people in advance to understand these are the stakes, you know, don't, don't fall for this. One of the, one of the things, and, and here's a warning, one of the things that we can expect, the disinformation that the media amplified recently about um, the uh, Israel-Hamas war, about the uh, the bomb uh, falling in the parking lot of the hospital. We can expect that level of yeah. disinformation and you know immediacy, uh, you know, and the the quick turnaround in the news cycle for the next election. The disinformation problem in the 2024 election is going to be worse than 2020 and 2016. And so you're going to see, I'll just predict right now, you're going to see messages that are going to try to exploit existing differences in the electorate, trying to convince people to stay home and don't vote, trying to convince people, you know, of all, all sorts of things. And here's the thing that they might already be sort of inclined to worry about, you know, so I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, Russian trolls just pour in and start amplifying things about Biden being old, because that seems to be something that, you know, people are talking about now. So will there be altered videos, you know, showing him, you know, speaking really slowly, you know, where they're, they're changing there already the, the are. time signature? Yep, there are, there already right? Are. It's right now the new thing is that he's pro-genocide. That's the yeah. new thing. And they've the, got a bunch of the people on the far left right. believing it now. Well, the, this, this is the target, I was going to say. Yeah. The target for Russian disinformation in the 2016 election the number one target was African American voters who they just didn't want to vote at all. And right. the second was Bernie Sanders supporters mm -hmm. and also Christian voters. I mean, these were the three that, that they went after. So that's why they had so many fake accounts that were BLM or Christian mothers right. for this or yeah. And so, you know, when you see something on social media and you think, oh my God, you know, when, when you, you feel your pulse go up, just imagine the possibility that's that's disinformation. And, and here's the problem. It's not going to be as easy to spot as it used to be because now AI is helping them to generate better and better disinformation. So, you that's know, right. uh, I, I have friends who stayed home because they were Bernie Sanders supporters and they were so upset, you know, so angry at, at Hillary Clinton that, you know, they wouldn't even vote. Not understanding that they might have fallen for disinformation from Russia, that that's exactly what they wanted them to do. You said before, Mark Twain, it's easier to fool somebody than to convince them that they've been fooled. People don't like to be fooled. So get your antenna up and you know guard against it because once you're fooled, it's kind of too late. Yeah. And you point out that throughout history, autocratic leaders have understood that the quickest way to control the population is to control their information sources. Yes. You know, flood the system with disinformation and make people question everything they hear. And in your book, which I think is brilliant, you use the example of that scene in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade where Indy finally finds the Holy Grail, but he doesn't know which one it is because it's surrounded by a hundred fakes. And you write, that's the point of disinformation. If you can't hide or destroy the truth, you surround it with lies. I want to thank you so much for joining us today, Lee. As you say, the truth isn't dying. It's just being killed by a coordinated campaign. Now, before you go, please tell people how they can follow your work and buy your book, because obviously this is a problem that isn't going away okay. and they might want to refer back to it. So there are links to buy my book on my website, leemcintyrebooks.com. Uh, it's available on all the, the big online platforms or independent bookstores. I've seen it at uh, many different stores. I was just down in Sydney, Australia, and I saw it at a few bookstores there. So, I mean, it is Huzzah. it is available. And it is a, in a, a very short book. This is the shortest book I've, I've ever written. It's a, it's a, uh, you could read it in an hour. It's you a, could. It's I a, did. It's a manifesto. I mean, it's a yeah. small little thing you can carry in your pocket. And here here's another thing I'd like to ask people to do. I mean, I'm an author. Obviously, I want people to buy the book. But when you buy the book, don't just put it on the shelf as a trophy. Give it to a friend. 
leave it on the bus, leave it in your Uber, you know, consume that book, pass it hand to hand. It's not a book, it's a training manual for what you can do before 2024. I'm trying to convince my publisher to release it as a box set. I want them to not just sell, you know, not just sell one, but sell six of them together with the, yeah. maybe in different colors, with the idea that you keep one and you give away five. Because, you know, I want people to, to read this book. Uh, I, I, I want, you know, the, the one thing that I really enjoy is having a platform where I'm able to talk to people about it and, you know, advocate for what I believe. But I feel like the book does a much better job of advocating than I do. So I hope that people do buy the book. If you want to see where, you know, other things that I've done and uh, other books I've written or places that I've spoken or will speak soon, that's all on my website as well, as is my email address. If you feel like writing me, uh, you can go ahead and uh, send me some mail. Marvelous. Thank you so much, Lee. I mean, at the end of the day, right, like it's it, it's a huge problem that we need to acknowledge. But if we know we're in the war, it means we can fight back. That's right. And I think that's what we need to remember at the end of the day, that we cannot just shut off from the people around us. We have to keep engaging. We have to do the work. We have to pass the book along, metaphorically and literally. Thank you for helping me to do that today. Thank you for coming. So that was Lee McIntyre, reminding us that we're in a war of disinformation, where it's not just about the lie itself, but about polarizing people around the lie. Because once you've created a group of people who can't be convinced of anything the other side says, then you have an army, where reality is secondary to what they are being told. We need to confront the liars, amplify the truth, and refuse to stop talking to those we disagree with. It may be hard to feel empathy for people who insult us or disrespect us or put us in danger, but we need to recognize that the way we feel, the way they feel, it's all part of the disinformation plan to separate us so the true believers are just easier to manipulate. We can't allow it. I want to thank Lee for joining us today and you for caring enough about democracy to be here. Now go push back on someone's bad ideas a little. Until next week, PG out. The Politics Girl podcast is written and performed by me, Lee McGowan, in partnership with the Midas Media Network and produced and edited by Happy Warrior Entertainment. All rights reserved.